want to welcome to the podcast assistant coach for the University of New Mexico women's basketball team, Coach Mackenzie Novak. Coach, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk some basketball. Yeah, previously, Coach Novak was on staff at George Washington as director of player development. Had the chance to meet her a few years ago now at a clinic I was at, I was at where her dad, Doug Novak, was speaking. And uh, since that time, she's been on staff both at Mercer and at George Washington and uh, now entering her first year with the Lobos and as, as an assistant. Uh, talking today about conceptual offense, more coaches at the college level and the high school level going towards more of a concept-based approach to playing on that side of the ball. And uh, I get from time to time questions from coaches about where to start, um, how to build things out, how to rep it. So today going to talk with someone who has worked with her dad who ran conceptual offense at several different colleges and universities. And then she herself has also had the opportunity to, to teach this kind of offense and introduce it at the college level. Um, to start with kind of broad, what are some of the more important or most important concepts that the players need to understand if they're going to be successful with a conceptual offense? So how we start teaching it is teaching them how to play in space. And for some of our players, they're like, oh, my goodness, we have never done this before. And it's really ugly at first. And, and what we kind of like to do is see what they do within this place. So we'll start from the top, play with the corner. And we'll give them a couple of constraints like this is how you're going to play with this corner person. And then we're playing from the wing to the wing. And then we'll play from the wing to the top. So that really takes care of the whole floor but that's how we simplify it in a really easy way so that they can understand it and they know like we'll be calling out shooting drills and we're going wing top like get to the wing get to the top so our language is really concise and going off of what players what's most important for players i would say that language like talking our language is huge one of my favorite stories from george washington right before i left uh, I was told a story about, we call it clocking over when you throw the ball into the post when everybody else has got to sprint around and get stationary behind the ball. And we call it clocking over. And one of our players, I heard that all of them were back at their dorms on the couch and somebody had gotten up off of the couch and she said, all right, everybody clock over. And I was like, that just made me laugh. And it made me really excited because when your language starts to bleed into everything that you do, um, it means that they're really buying in and they're excited about it. And if you can transfer what you learn on the basketball court to something life related, even if it's as silly as clocking over on the couch, that to me means that we did a decent job teaching it and they're able to apply it in other areas of their life. Um, that was pretty a pretty fun experience. Uh, one thing that you said, and, and I have talked to some other coaches who have done it this way, um, but typically you have that hole to part and then back the hole again. Mm -hmm. um, did I understand right what you just said? This yes. is more so of just like parts to hole. And there's almost uh, uh, the players almost don't understand exactly what they're doing yet. Is that right. kind of the idea? Yeah. And we're so focused on building the habits that we don't want them to think too much. Mm -hmm. That's something I really, um, I would say I really learned by doing it is that oftentimes, and maybe this is especially women's basketball, they want to know all the answers. Mm -hmm. So we're trying so much to develop habits so they're not thinking while they're doing them. Um, and I can show you in the clips too, but like we're doing shooting drills that are from the wing to the top. And we're doing finishing school from the top to the corner. So they don't always know that they're getting reps, but they're getting offensive reps within everything that we do. Um, so I think finding a way to teach it uh, in a way that's not always like, well, we're working on offense. You're actually working on your individual skills within the space that we're giving you. Um, that to me is really important because they need to feel like they're getting better. That's the most important thing, especially in the postseason preseason and then you get into the season and obviously offense is important and the way you play together is important but in order for those kids to be excited to come to practice and want to come back in january february the dog days of basketball season if they can feel like oh i learned how to do a barkley reverse nash layup whatever it is um seeing the excitement on their face and just getting them to come back the next day ultimately would be our goal 
when I first heard that that was the way that it was taught, it was kind of I, I, I didn't quite understand it uh, because so much of just how coaches typically have taught things have been like this is our I'll go old school. This is our flex offense and you show it and then you break down the parts and the players are OK, I kind of get like and then you go back. Um, but that has worked with teaching patterns. But I have found that when you when the whole thing's made up of concepts, it would almost blow their mind at the beginning if you told them everything that you were trying to do. It, it just wouldn't make sense. Is right. it fair to say? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So I, um, we'll come back and show some of those things. Um, but w what are some of the what are some of the actions like what what dictates what players are doing, I guess is a better way to say it. Well, I'll start with one thing that you just said that made me um, think of it. We always start with the end in mind. So stride stops is what we teach for our finishing school. That's how we start everything. Like that's on day one of George Washington. That's what we did. And I didn't even know what George Washington was necessarily going to turn into. It ended up progressing into something really special. But we started with the stride stops. Um, so we taught everybody finishing school. And then we moved them outside, um, like outside of the paint. And then we're doing finishing school from the three-point line or from different areas. Um, and they don't necessarily know it, but it's still like that footwork is what we're watching. We're watching, are you getting your hand to the glass? Are you getting a foot in the circle? And then the next thing we do right after is those shooting drills, which are huge because we're so focused on your feet that you're working finishing school while you're working the footwork or sorry, while you're working the shooting drills. Mm. Um, so our, our footwork is so important. That's like the first conceptual skill we would teach is our feet, their stride stops, finishing school, um, that whole series. And then how does that progress to the, whether that's the, you know, two, two man, two man, you know, actions that happen, three man, whatever, mm -hmm. what does that progression look like? Yeah. So after we do that, we're going to play a lot. Um, so we play, if we, for example, if we're working the top to corner action and we're working that say finishing school and then we're going to do a shooting segment and then we're going to go play live two on two or one on one from the top to the corner now one thing i, I i'll add that i think really helps blend everything together and if i could have done it earlier it well if i knew what i do now i would have done it earlier mm -hmm. um and that's the whole keeping your dribble alive series i think that is just it's beautiful and it blends the concepts together and it allows the players to go to where they need to go so we have a like a pizza slice chart but essentially if you can get a foot in that smile we're saying stride stop and you're going finishing school so you're either going stride stop outside hand donut reverse all of those things but if you can't get a foot in the circle then we're teaching you can go barkley you kill the dribble you're turning your back to the basket, trying to get to home base, trying to score on the other side of the rim. Or you can go Nash. But giving them the option to keep their dribble alive um, really helps not pick the ball up in bad spots. So we always say the ball talks. Like you get to the, the top corner, you get to the elbow, we're calling Phil, you pop the ball, that's what sends that person up. But if you get to no man's land and you're in, in the middle of nowhere, people don't know how to play with you. Um, so that, that is the biggest teaching point, And that's the biggest learning curve that a lot of the players will have is they're not used to being told, this is where we're picking the ball up. Uh, another constraint I would say we have is like you change direction at the elbow. That's the only place where we're changing direction. Um, and there's different things like we'll take up vertical slack, uh, when it's guard guard, but knowing where your teammates are going to be is just way easier and it, it allows for more freedom within the constraints if that makes sense yeah for sure and i would just concur as soon as you get them to understand if i don't get to where i need to be i don't have to pick up my dribble because if you pick up your dribble you immediately cut the options that you have and it it right. a lot of times you can pretty much kill I know for most of us, we have this, it's pace and space and we're trying to play out of it. I mean, that's the name that we give it to it. Mm -hmm. Your pace is dead because the, you're just options are so few and, and, and there, there's nothing, there's hardly anything to do with it. And just by them keeping that dribble alive, 
um, and playing with either, either a Barkley or a Nash, you're able to continue with the, with different options. And what you were just saying with that was um, the, the concepts that you then build on top of that really are all predicated on what happens there with the finishing moves. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as coaches, as you listen to this, um, I've got some who have, they're already using conceptual offense. Others are thinking about, you know, just starting it. Others, you know, better ways of teaching it or being able to better teach it. To this point, from everything that she said, I, I would think you, first of all, have to know the end in mind, like she just said. Um, and then from there, the finishing school and the shooting are kind of like your cornerstones for the entire offense. If, if you, you can't do those two things, you severely limit what your team can do or how effective your offense is going to be within whatever offense you decide to, to use wherever their positioning is and that kind of thing. Uh, can you mention positioning, like where players start and how everything kind of moves off of that? Yeah. So the layout that we're playing in is the, well, I just learned what these lines were the other day, the, uh, the defensive shoot. You'll have to cut this part out because I'm screwing up here. Right. But uh, we always start on the two, the two lines extended, like the pro lanes. Those are our guard spots. Um, so we have those two guard spots and then the two corners. And now we like the corners to be up a little bit, not necessarily deep corners, right about the block extended. Um, that's our spacing. Um, and then we also like, we put boxes on the floor. So we taped up big boxes. You know, you never want to put a player in a box, but for spacing, we need you to stay in a box, um, and sprint to those spots because everyone really likes to put their toes on the three point line. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just want to create as much space as possible. So we're two, three feet, probably more than that behind the three point line, the volleyball line, we put those boxes out and then our post starts underneath the rim and then we're playing within those spots in all of our actions wing 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 top top corner awesome okay all right this is the point where i would like for us to kind of pull up the film so if you're listening to this this is where you want to go find this on youtube and mckenzie's going to show us some of the clips that she has from that she had there at george washington and just go ahead and just talk us through whatever whatever you want to but you know some of the things especially that you've already mentioned at the beginning so that people can see and understand some of the terminology that you've already used right okay this first one we have here is top corner so we're going to start right now let's see we're going to start we just go simple this is what we call core shooting and we do this every day so we do different segments of course shooting. And as the season goes on, uh, depending on how a team would be guarding us or depending on what we're not good at, I'll create different actions and then we'll play through them. Um, but this one is just the simplest. We're going top corner, quick pitch threes. So this is how we, how we teach it. You're going top corner. These are your decisions. So see how she's right at the elbow, the way this defender's playing, she can't beat this man. We're always hitting the first open man. And one thing we're really, we're really focused on is left foot down, ready to shoot. So we're throwing that quick pitch. Anytime we, we throw this ball, it's always penetrate, pitch, and post. So here she's holding, and she's holding to have a two-way drive. So that's our first action out of there. Same thing. We have quick pitch threes. These are really good. It's a good shooting drill. You get a lot of shots up. Okay, next thing. Here we'll do it at a three-on-three. She didn't beat her man. The quick pitch isn't there. She got to the elbow and stride stopped. So again, the ball talks. That's telling this player to come out of the corner and fill is what we call it. So she's playing with the corner. I like this pop. Her pops, this pop isn't great. That ball needs to be right by the side of her face. You're shielding the ball from the defense. And then again, penetrate pitch and post. She's sliding right into the corner so we can get a two-way drive. We get an escape three, and those are really good for us. Can you show that again and use or emphasize the terminology escape and show people what that is? Yeah. Okay, right here. So she just penetrate, pitch, and post. We have wing, and we have someone right here at the block. So she's going to drive middle. She doesn't stride stop here. I want to stride stop here. So you're stride stopping and you're turning away from the defense. This person's escaping out to the corner. 
you're throwing it back for a shot. Now, how you teach this, let's see right here. Let's see how good of a job she does. What will happen is we play this from the barrel. So we do this at a button hook game a lot as well. But as soon as this person takes a dribble, her she's going this way. Her right foot needs to cross over and get out. For some reason, people don't like to get out fast. So that was a really big um, emphasis on like, as soon as she takes a dribble, you're going. So she sprints out, stride, stop, pivot, and you're hitting that three. And I found that that's the shot that is often created if you do it right, because the defender can't help themselves there, even if they're not needed to help. Mm -hmm. they freeze there for a second. Right. And when they, when they freeze, that opens up that player who's escaping out either in this case underneath, or if she'd have driven baseline and escapes out. And then that that's when you, that that's your long closeout. So we're all talking about how do you create long closeouts? Right. Using an escape is a great way to create a long closeout for the defense that you can either then shoot or attack. I'm not huge on double drives, but that's for another day. Yeah. It's a long closeout that the, 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 the shooter can shoot. Right. And, and I'll add one more thing. A big emphasis when we're teaching this is drive to score. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to do this, and then they're going to throw that pass 16 times in a row. And you're going to be like, what are you doing? But just an emphasis of you're driving to score a layup, and you're automatically going to draw two defenders. But if you're driving to pass, you're not going to draw anybody, and then you're going to turn and pivot, and it's not going to be open. So just reiterating always, you're driving to score. You draw a defender, that's when you kick the pass. That's good. There's another escape. We, we did escape shooting almost every day. That's how important it was, and that's how often we got it, is that we needed to practice sprinting out um, and getting stationary there. Uh, this is just another thing. We do a lot of this, like, game – We'll go in the season, we'll go five on five situational offense. We didn't miss a day of situational offense. So that would just be us picking, putting people in spots that we're in a lot and maybe we're not doing well in. Um, so we did this one a lot. We'll start the ball on the wing. We put a person here. This is a guard that we had posted up. And then we have the top over here. So we're playing three on three. Escapes. Okay, this is kind of messy. But these guys are good. They've been doing this stuff for a long time. This is our, our spring our spring workout, throw it across, get a fingers cut. We have great defenders with our GAs. These guys were really good, but they started jumping stuff. So she reads that pretty well, gets a fat cut, throws a drift pass. I mean, that was a pretty good possession right there. There's another fat cut. Before we go on, I don't have any bounce out clips, but I'll just go over one more time the teaching of top to corner. So the rule always is if you can beat your man, go score a layup. That's always number one. So anything we start starts with that. Uh, number two, if you can't, if, if the defender is giving you this quick pitch, you always throw the quick pitch. Number three, if you can't get through the elbow, you can't get to the elbow, you can pop it and then you'll play fill. And then if you can't get to the elbow, you can't get through it, you're going to turn and you're going to bounce out. And then we're going to attack in a different way. Um, so that's just an action that would, we throw it across, bring our post up back screen. We get a post up. And if not, we get into a, a different action, but those are, that's the sequence of, of teaching of top corner. That's great. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Awesome. Um, should we go to, you want to watch some wing wing and wing top? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, perfect. Okay. So here's, uh, we're playing from the wing to wing. So this is just a shooting drill. We start them here. Now, if you watch, this is something we were really focused on in, in the off season because we wanted to eliminate our turnovers. So a coach is tossing the ball to this player right here because we want it, we want them to catch and look for their shots every single time. It's a non-negotiable. I don't care if you're a shooter. I don't care if you're not a shooter. Always catch and look for your shot because as a defender, it's the same thing you said earlier. This person's going to come out and guard you if you go like this. It's inevitable. It's against everything. Um, even if they're a 10% shooter, like that's what people are going to do. If you go and look like you're going to shoot. Uh, so that was a really, really big emphasis, um, this postseason. So we're going bypass threes again, same. The teaching point here is you're driving. As soon as your foot hits the paint, that's what brings up this person from the corner. 
and then you're posting because it's penetrate, pitch, and post. Okay, this is good. Here's some keeping your dribble alive segments. So we're here. You get cut off. You get into a Barkley. It's the same thing. As soon as your foot hits the paint, you're coming out, posting for a three. Watch one more of these. These are good. It's good to mix in the Barclays to the core shooting because um, that just helps blend everything together. And again, that wasn't a strike. That's something we really, really talk about is throwing strikes because to be a better shooting team, you have to give yourself a chance. Mm -hmm. And in order to give yourself a chance is you got to throw strikes. And, and we kind of joke about it. We always said, well, if you throw the ball up here, it kind of tells your teammate that you don't love them. But you throw it to them right in the chest and right in the shot pocket, it's telling them that you love them. And you got to be a little careful about that, but that's, <laughs> that's how we taught it. Um, now here, this is good. We, we ended up doing Barclays a lot this season. So then we got into fake Barkley, drift pass. You can spin off the back. That's another really good skill uh, to teach. And, and they really like doing that. Let me say one thing about the Barclays just from experience. And this year we we had to it was it was something that about halfway through the year, the head coach and I who who were talking, he was actually out. So I was head coaching and mm -hmm. had the opportunity for him to watch more film. And we were kind of struggling to to create the number of three pointers that we wanted to to create for our offense. Um and the Barclays. As soon as we put an emphasis on that, he said, I don't think we're, we're doing enough Barclays. We had, um, we have the, the kind of the top guy there has come down in transition. We use coach Mike neighbors functionally fast and have the yeah. dragon, the four that, that drags from behind. And we had a, a, a great dragon. He was a senior who did a great job of getting into the paint and Barkley at Barkley ying. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as soon as he did started doing that more, we started generating more three point attempts and it wasn't just from that spot. It was from, yeah. because um, we all know that the post up, you know, typically leads to defenses that turn, look at the ball, come in towards the ball. Sometimes you may have a double team that creates a kick out one more or whatever. And just by putting an emphasis on the Barclays, we were able to generate more threes. And I mentioned that because you just said, when it comes to practicing this, the thing that I love about playing this way and also being able to practice for this way is that you can do five on five and five on five doesn't have to look like let's just play fives and check it up and start a possession. You can start with whatever you want. You said, you know, if we weren't good at the escape stuff, like we would start with a scenario that would create an escape. And whether or not you score out of the escape, you can end up playing a 10, 15 second possession that leads to other things that you're getting the opportunity to rep your offense at more than just the escapes. And I felt like that made us, that's one of the keys to creating a good conceptual offense team is that you're able to focus in on things because of the way you practice, but you're still repping the other things because you are doing so much playing. Right. Definitely. And I'll add to that. One thing we really focused on um, was we called them work ethic possessions. That's what it came down to. That became our terminology. So at first, like you have to work really, really hard to get to all this stuff. And, you know, because you've done it, like it's not easy and you have mm -hmm. to practice it a lot in order for everyone to understand where they're supposed to go, when they're supposed to be. But then all of a sudden it, it starts to develop and you start to see some really exciting stuff. Um, so when we showed film, we started showing the work ethic possessions and, and it became a little bit of like, a, Oh, that, Hey, that was a great possession. It might not have ended on a made shot. Like not all these clips are made shots and that's fine, but some of them are really good possessions. And so we continued to fight for those, those great possessions for the best shot we can get. Um, and I think everybody really bought into that. And that was something we were focused on. And that's important. Now I learned from that. I, I You can focus on that too much. Mm -hmm. um, so like I, I'm excited to learn from Coach Bradbury because they're really, really elite in transition offense. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a part of my coaching that I'm excited to, to get better at. Okay, so this is something we do every day, almost every day. So First, I'll start with this. We're always going to start on the baseline and we're going to pound the ball. 
and we're going to go 50 pounds right, 50 pounds left. And what happens is sometimes they don't always take it seriously. So then we go say you have to pound the ball as hard as you can, and there can't be any space between your ball, the ball, and your hand. That's how we teach it. And then we'll go pounds to kills. So like when we get into a Barkley, it's that same exact action. We'll do all that on the baseline. And that stuff is really important. But then we do this, this arc speed dribbling. And this might be the best dribbling drill that just, what's the word, uh, exposes you. Hmm. Because if you can't dribble, you're going to lose the ball when you try to turn the corner. Like we did this a couple of days ago and two, three kit like, if you can't dribble, you're losing the ball. Mm-hmm. So then they start to take the pounds more seriously. Anytime we're doing there, it's like, okay, this really is important, actually. Um, but these, these are our biggest things. We're trying to keep the hand on top of the ball, always eyes on the rim, and then we're pounding the ball as hard as you can. So we're telling them you got to sprint as fast as you can around the arc. So we always go right, and then we'll go left as fast as you can and and they'll try to slow down to to keep a handle on the ball but the speed is more important so you're able to do that okay here i have some pounds to kills so we would just pound the ball as hard as you can and then kill it all the way down and it's really that last dribble that's so important um to get the ball back up to your hand and again that's going to exploit you you're not going to be able to do that right away Um, and then this is another one we'll go we'll go walking pounds So they're squeaking their feet a little bit. They're going slow. We're really focused on their base. They should have a wide base. Again, the same thing, hand right on top of the ball. Um, And they're pounding it as hard as they can. Then we'll go the same thing going back. And then we like to put some resistance on them as well, um, just so they have some, a body on them. Okay, and then there's one more. This is this is another, this is one of the best ones. Okay, give me one second. I'm gonna share a different video because I thought of something that I think is really good. Okay. Um, so I have had on the show several people who have talked about conceptual offense, but what I like about this is you have both shown for the people that have been here to watch it or talked about how what it really looks like to actually put this together, which I think is one of the, more challenging things for people that are teaching that have never taught this before. And one of the things that I hope that they see that you can confirm for me and then kind of tell me how you go about doing it a little bit. Um, you showed us some of the drills and that kind of stuff is the fact that coaching this way, this style of, of offense really combines everything into one. In other words, you have elements of player development. You have elements of um, team team system type stuff. Um, and you have elements of shooting, which are like the, the main things that I hear about when, pe- when people talk about skill development and those things are all done at the same time. Um, which I feel like, and this is the thing that you can confirm with me and kind of talk maybe a little bit about how, how you do it and what it looks like in the summer months, as well as during the school year is, it really maximizes your time. It is in an efficient way to coach. You don't necessarily feel like, all right, now we have to work on our shooting. All right, now we have to work on our, and for a group of people who time is never enough, there's never enough time for coaches. Um, this has been revolutionary for me as a coach because it really allows me to maximize my time. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say like finishing school, we do a lot of the tossing, finishing school, um, and then just driving, finishing school at the beginning. But once the season goes on, we're not doing that stuff. We're very little on air stuff. That's just the teaching at the beginning. Yes, definitely. And then the more I've learned and the more I've talked to people and talked to my dad, like you're really only solidifying what you taught when you play. Mm hmm. So like if you go through all this stuff on air, but you never play, they never learn what works and what doesn't work. So your teaching is basically no. So the best thing to do is to always test. Like we try to never miss testing. That's what what I learned um, was so important. Um, But what I was saying with the finishing is that that just translates into offense. So we're running maybe a fingers, a fill to a bypass. Like we might run that series and then you're finishing in some way. But we're always finishing against a pad. I think those pads are huge because you're teaching people to go into contact. Um, 
or they're going against a scout team guy, but they're going against somebody because you're never on air is just not likely. It's good for teaching, but beyond that, I think it's really important to use that pad. Um, and I think it probably all started because my dad was at Bethel and division three, you don't have that much time. Right. Like they never had summers or anything with their players. Um, so he just became really efficient in the way that he taught and I was able to learn and I'm still learning and working on it, but he was so efficient in practice. Like I loved being in his practices because it was so fast paced. Like you, not everybody's getting a rep at everything. And so it just keeps you on your toes. Um, and the pace of practice is really fun and you don't always necessarily know what's coming next. You have an idea of everything, but just everything you do is sprinkled within your different segments of practice. So I think that's, that's a fun part. I think it's fun for the players too, because they can work on those skills while we're going five on five in some segment. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There is a level of um, excitement, intensity, focus, even in the the waning parts of the season where sometimes players can get kind of tired. And I mean, college basketball season is long. And when you practice this way, it, it stays fun because there's not a, oh, we have to do this now. I mean, they're just playing and they, that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've been able to kind of keep their attention longer and uh, keep focus, add add new things in every now and then. But it's at the end of the day, they're just playing. And honestly, it's just it's more fun for me. Uh, I, there's been yeah. some times where I've gone back to because of some thing camps or something that I've been in and we do kind of more boring type <laughs> type drills. And I just think, man, I, I can't go. There's no way I could go back to coaching this way. Right. It's just it's just more fun. Um, and I think, too, you showed some clips there about about halfway through with the two on two and three on three. It gets more players, more reps when you practice that way. And so I, I think the the ceiling and the floor kind of, of of talent on your team is kind of narrowed because it's not just the starters that are getting the reps playing the five on five and. Um, that could be a whole nother episode, but just mm -hmm. having, having watched some of your dad's practices, like the, all the way down to the last guy, like he's involved in things because it is so quick, fast pace mm -hmm. that it's five on five and then a new five and then against the new five and everybody's getting the opportunity to get better. And that benefits you in the long run, because like I said, that, that gap between the top and the bottom kind of narrows and you may need a kid to call upon him or it just develops a kid that goes from a freshman to a sophomore, junior, whatever. Um, the last thing I'll ask you, you've alluded to some of these before. What's maybe one, two, three, whatever you want, things that you've learned that you wish you'd have known from the beginning or just looking back, if I'd have done this differently from the beginning, it, it really would have helped us along the way. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say the first thing is, is keeping your dribble alive brings everything together. Yeah. Like you have to teach in the segmented order. I talked about earlier, top corner, wing top, um, wing, wing, you got to teach all that stuff, but the keeping your dribble alive, you got to teach that right away. Um, and you have to be like the first time you teach it, you can be nice about it, but they're not always going to understand. The second time is like, no, this is where we're picking the ball up. We're mm -hmm. not picking the ball up here. Um, it's a non-negotiable. You're taking a decision away. This is what we do. This is how we play. Um, I think that's really beneficial. And the more that we focused on that, the better we got and, and the better shots we got. So that, that would really be the biggest thing, um, I'm thinking of right now. Uh, the second thing I, we did, I thought really helped us, um, was our film sessions. So we did positive offense and instructional offense, and we did this about every day. Um, and I would always try to pick just not too many clips because sometimes as coaches, we could get carried away and we like film. Like I could be in the film room for hours and just love it. But I know that's not how players are. So looking back, like I need to always cut those shorter. That's mm -hmm. something I need to work on. Uh, protect myself, protect the team a little bit. Just pick three or four clips. But but we ended up doing a pretty good job. Always instructional offense and always positive offense. So whatever we're emphasizing that day or that next practice, that's what we're doing in the film sessions. And we did that in the spring and the summer. 
And I think that helps speed up your learning because they're able to see, they're able to see themselves. And Mm -hmm. tell me what player doesn't like to watch themselves on film. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes to watch themselves. So even if you bring a kid in for five minutes and watch film, um, I think it's, it's really helpful, but, but as a team that definitely helped us. Yeah. The less is more with the film has been revolutionary. Another one of those really big ones. You you have a thousand things to say as a coach, mm-hmm. but it's so much more effective. And especially if you do it that way, where you have a couple things that you're correcting and then a couple things that you're positively reinforcing that's changed the way that our, our film sessions have gone. And I think it's been a whole lot more effective. And like you said, keeps kids attention. And yeah, that, that's, that's a big one there. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome and stuff. I oh, have one final thing that I, I learned, especially this spring is like our players love learning new things. Yeah. So I think that sometimes it's like, Oh, we don't want to give them too much, but teaching them new skills that they can excel at. They love. So we have finishing school and then our players actually came up with this name hook school. So we're working all of our different jump hooks, shimmy, all those things, but like they love those types of things. So I just think always remembering that, Our players like to learn new things, whether it's in the dog days of January, February, like just keep adding stuff because they do enjoy learning. And I think as coaches, we do too. So that that's when you said that, that really sparked it for me. Yeah. And I think that that ends up in your team continuing to progress and get better as the year goes on, which as we all know, we want our teams peaking, but we sometimes don't necessarily know how that happens or how to do that or how to at least give us ourselves the chance to that to actually happen and i feel like playing this way coaching this way teaching it because you continue to you can continue to refine the way that you play this system right. and i know everybody can say that but i think especially playing this way allows for that continual growth that happens all the way through late february and into march and um that's another one of those things i've i've seen happen for our team since we've been playing this way so yeah a ton of great stuff i think even in the clips um maybe i should ask you this too like resources for maybe learning more about this whether it's something with your dad's website or that kind of thing Mm -hmm. you know the first time that maybe too if you give them the website and tell them like what to look at because it's it's continued to grow and it was big when i first found it and now and i felt like when i first found it like i i knew it was awesome I had, I knowing what I know now, there was so much more that was available there, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And, and two, with the clips that you showed, like there were a lot of things that were in that, that like concepts to teach and that kind of thing where people may have been watching and been like, oh yeah, cool. But those were like really key reads or things. I'm thinking even about the stuff that, you know, veer stuff or veer burn or like those mm-hmm. kinds of things. Um, where should they go to kind of find out more about all of this? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give you my email first so you can ask me any questions and I'll send any video or any information um, over to you. It's Mac, M-A-C, Novak, N-O-V-A-K 12 at gmail.com. And then I'll also give you a really big tool. It's it's my dad's website. It's got all these different concepts. So that's coachdugnovak.com. And if you go to the style of play page, you'll be able to see how everything is blended together. I know we, we broke it down a lot here, which is good, but coaches need to see the end and need to see what it looks like. So you can watch um, what all the, the end looks like from, I mean, I think we have until like 2013. So from a long time ago. Um, but if you, if you dive into that under the style of play page, there's also a bunch of um, PDFs on what certain actions are. We have like a player development PDF that would be an off season type of thing. Um, there's a ton of shooting drills, escape drills, and then there's also a concepts page, which that would be more similar to like what we talked about tonight. Um, but there's a ton of stuff on there. So dive in, but please feel free to reach out to me and then you can give you my phone number and we can text and I would love to ask any questions. And I just like to learn about basketball. So awesome. That's coach McKenzie Novak, assistant coach for the New Mexico Lobos coach. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.